Boogie, and this is True Go Go Story. <laughs> He pretty much um, had the girls together. Some of them went to Duke Ellington School. Some of them went to Blaisburg High School. Different sc high schools. So the girls were um, older than I was. I was the baby of the band. Um, um, once he got the girls together, um, he sat down and explained um, everything that's going to go on. Um, contracts. We're going to be doing recordings. This is going to be big. And we all look like we was excited and was like, "Yeah, right, okay." So it's like you gotta, you guys gotta realize it's gonna be the first girl go go band, um, and it's really gonna be big. And so we we didn't believe it. We was like, "Okay, we were excited at first." And was like, "No, nah, it's not gonna be true." And back then, men were the dominating. Or I'm gonna say men and boys because there were teenage bands playing our age. Um, they were dominating the go go scene. Um, you didn't hear about no female bands or female singers sing it with, uh, you know, with a band, a go-go, men's go-go band, a boy's go-go band now. So, um, we were kind of excited about it, but we didn't really think it was going to be true or what's going to happen. Um, we started practicing for a whole year. Um, Roy Battle, who's a wonderful, phenomenal music director, producer, uh, you name it, plays every instrument, um, phenomenal, but um, he had us in military boot camp. <laughs> um, we had rehearsal at least four days a week. It might have been more than that. For about a year, um, we didn't, we couldn't go to no shows outside of practice or rehearsal. Um, it was straight practice. Um, straight rehearsal, um, actually, I don't even think he let us even take a break. <laughs> Um, we did that for a whole year. Um, couldn't talk about it. I mean, <laughs> practice for a whole year. Um, <clears throat> as far as talking about it to anyone, um, we actually all really didn't have a life on the outside. Um, it was school and then straight to rehearsal, practice. Um, you couldn't hang out with your friends. You couldn't talk to your friends about what was going on as far as the band. It was a real big secret. And when I say it was a big secret, when we came out a year later, it was big, and that's how Pleasure hit the scene. <clears throat> For as the first um, all-girl go-go band in um, DMV, um, our first, one of the first gigs was Evans Grill, <laughs> which was located in Forsville. Um, I can remember walking in, and it was like a pool hall. Um, you had men shooting pool. Um, they looking at us like, okay, who is these little girls and what what are they doing up in here? Um, after the you walk through past the men shooting pool, you go into another side of the uh, the little I'm say little juke joint. It was like a little juke joint. Um, they had a stage. Um, they had a dance floor. Um, some of the wood when you walk is a little cracky. You hear little squeaks, but it, it was an okay juke joint. Um, Back then, um, Charlie Fenwick, he was our manager. Um, he had a band called High Coast Sweat, which was like our big brother band, you know, of the circuit. Um, they um, performed um, on the show with us, and we actually, actually opened up for them. Um, the instruments were already set up. Um, I was so short and little then, you know, the, the Congos I used, they were rock steadies, and um, my manager wouldn't adjust the Congos for me, so they had crates for me, and I had to stand on crates 
and um, play on crates <laughs> while I was performing. It was real cool. Um, that first performance, everybody was excited. They were sized. They was like, wow, you know, where can I, can I get them? Where can I book them? And, you know, from there, we started, um, we started gigging there every week at Evans Room. And then other shows um, were coming in. And the pleasure was just going and going and going. All right, so before Pleasure came out, we in the studio for about a year, at least four or five days a week. Um, it was like a little miniature boot camp. Um, we practiced at least, I'm going to say, 10 hours a day, four or five days a week for a whole year before we came out. Um, I had to wear wrist weights on both my arms, um, and this is to help form my hands to hit the Congos right and also to make me strong instead of lifting weights I had weights on my wrist. Um, it was like a leather strap with metal bars, like 10 metal balls, uh, bars surrounding my whole wrist and I had to play with them for 10 hours, 4 to 5 days a week. Um, you know, people ask me, why is you get your biceps out? You, do you lift weights? And I'm like, no, this comes from the wrist weights. And it actually makes you, looks like you got big muscles. Um, Roy, um, who's a tremendous, tremendous producer, <laughs> I'm going to say this again, producer, um, songwriter, <clears throat> music director, which he was our music director, he plays every instrument. Um, he's the one who put us through this boot camp um, to make us stronger and make us feel better. Um, actually, uh, our drummer also, she had to wear weights on her ankles so she can kick the foot better on the drums. And which it did help. Um, you hear that boom, <laughs> boom, the drums, boom, the, uh, the foot pedal, boom, boom. And she also, both of us, we, I had wrist weights, she had um, ankle weights on. And um, that's what built both of us up, our arms, our legs, um, the way we play, our form of how we play. And also, um, so you won't tire, tire out real fast or uh, lose your breath while you're playing, it also keep your energy up also. So we had to both wear, um, wear those wrist and weights um, for a whole year, at least four to five days a week. As time went by, we was getting closer and closer to coming out and we had to think of some stage names. And um, some of them, um, Taco Sweat uh, group came through and it was like, uh, you know, you remind me um, of Jungle Boogie, your style, the way you play. And I was like, Jungle Boogie? I said, that's big because he's a legendary Congo player in the city. And he has a real big name of, you know, how he play and his style. And I was like, wow. And he was like, you look like you could be his daughter. And I didn't realize that until one day I did see him, well, you know, with the same skin complexion. <laughs> so I was like, okay. I was like, well, maybe I'll come up with Lil Boogie. And how we came up with Lil Boogie is because um, on shows, when I had to stand on the crates to reach the Congos, um, that's how I came up with, okay, Lil Boogie, and then the little came from me standing on the crates playing, which a lot of people don't know that I was playing um, on crates, standing on crates to reach the Congos to play. Um, and then the boogie came from the jungle boogie part. Did, so. he, did he ever say anything about it? Did you ever meet him and he said yes, something about I, Yeah, I met him and um, he, he said, you know, he, he proud of me and he loves what I'm doing. And he said, I actually am a good Congo player and I can play. So he was cool with the name? Yes. So, you know, we were getting shows, um, you know, back to back. Our manager was getting a lot of calls. Um, we were getting a lot of uh, magazine offers, and um, we was in Sister, Sister Magazine. Um, kind of blew up on the circuit, and um, as the all-girl female go-go band, um, 
we started um, with promoters wanting us to headline shows because we were bringing in the fans and bringing in the money. Um, you actually then you had some bands um, out here who felt that they were out here playing longer than we were. They cranked better than we do. They didn't understand uh, as females um, because we're pretty. Um, why we had to headline and they couldn't headline and the thing was it, it was a thing where they said well you know we they don't crank we crank and y'all just doing this because they're females and they're pretty but it wasn't that and the promoter seen that the fans seen that we were bringing in money we were bringing in big fans and the promoters in the ears it was hearing oh no they crank they crank they sound good and we were putting out cassette tapes PA tapes then and they were selling, um, but the band, some of the bands, um, you know, they didn't like that. And as, you know, all boys or all men band, they didn't understand, you know, we were out here longer, you know, why are they headlining the show? It's about who's bringing in the money and bringing in the fans. That's what the promoters going to look at. They're not going to look at um, anything else. Okay, they're pretty. Let's, let them, let's headline. And they got on this nice outfit. Let them headline. No, it's not about that. And we had a little bit of situation, you know, back then. It was a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of bands, I'm going to say. They were like, you know, hating and just saying a lot of commotion for no reason. Right. <laughs> yeah, so back then it was a lot of controversy. I'm not going to say hating, but a lot of controversial conversations about, you know, why is Pleasure headlining and, you know, it's because we were bringing in the money. But... If it was up to, up to me, um, you know, back then, I, as a teenager, I wasn't out running and playing with my friends, and, 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 you know, I was into the music all the time, so it was like I wanted to live a kind of a normal life. I wanted to be the band that played first, so I can pack, we can pack up and go home, but of course, we always played, it's at nighttime, so... That wasn't going. That wasn't going to happen. Even if I did, we did play first. We weren't going to get back in time for me to, you know, go play with my friends and all that. But um, yeah, I didn't. I never understood that. Um, it doesn't matter who goes first. It, you know, just play music, have fun. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, <clears throat> let me see what's next. What pleasure? How pleasure broke up? Or the first band members dispersed. Uh, you had to get any name. Just keep it. Okay. You can keep it broad. Um, cause you were only you were left by yourself. That's yeah. fact. So right. <laughs> so um, you know we were you know on the road moving. Pleasure was you know making CD. I'm um, sorry. Um, tapes, PA tapes, selling, um, doing magazines and stuff. Um, and then um. We had a show at the I believe at the Capitol Center, and we were always on. Um, when the national act comes in, we were always on the show at the Capitol Center with the national act. Um, it was Salt and Pepper, Biz Markey, um, Heavy D, and us as our own band. We never performed like behind or back up any big artists. We were always our own band as our own artists. Um, it's just one day um, I came in to the studio and the band had broke up, left, gone. <laughs> I was by myself. <clears throat> um, you know, Charlie explained to me <clears throat> what was going on as far as um, the girls left on the road to go with Herbie Lovebug and Salt and Pepper. <clears throat> um, it was told that I was left because of, you know, a whole bunch of lies that had nothing to do with me. And I could have been left out of that conversation as far as why you want to leave the band and go on the road. I could have been just leave me out. You could have just left. But um, I was here still the original member left. And um, we had to not pretty much start over. I'm not going to say that because I was still the original member. We had to keep pleasure moving. So pleasure relaxed for a minute, the name. And then we came back with 
new members in the, in the group. We had a, a lot of um, offers and um, deals that were going to go through before we separated. Um, we were actually offered to do a cartoon. Um, whoever was the producer for Fat Albert um, cartoon that used to come on every Saturday, um, they were offered a um, pleasure to do a cartoon. Um, we also got an offer to um, go on tour with Chuck Brown when he went to Japan. We were off, one of the bands um, were offered to do um, a tour um, on, you know, to Japan with Chuck. Um, and it, it didn't feel through, but uh, Pleasure was going through some changes um, and some offers we couldn't take. Um, we also um, were on Channel 8 um, cable channel. Um, this one, uh, the DC Cable um, Channel 8. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we also did a segment on that, and they played that every day. It was Channel 8, DC, um, DC Cable Channel 8. Um, I don't want to say news, but it was a, a very popular channel like the jukebox back mm -hmm. then. Um, MH, MHZ, was it that one? I'm not sure. Who, who it was, but it was Channel 8. If you say every time you turn on Channel 8, it was on, um, if you had cable, period. Um, and like I said, we did um, a photo shoot in the System magazine. That was in the early 90s. Um, I think, believe you can Google it. I don't have the magazine on me, but um, our picture, um, we did a photo shoot and there's a picture in there of us. Um, that was in the early 90s. So we had a lot of big offers um, with the second um, set of girls who came in Pleasure. Pleasure also, um, with the second girls that came in Pleasure, um, we did, like the Capitol Center, we were always on a national act. Um, they had the Richie Coliseum, which was like the Capitol Center um, in Virginia. Um, and on that show, it was us as our own artist, Pleasure. Um, Big Daddy Kane. Um, Kwame, which I have pictures personally with them guys, um, Shaba Ranks, um, it was funny, um, and also Heavy D, don't want to forget him, um, it was funny because um, we were almost the headliner um, artists on that show, um, but Shaba Ranks ended up being the headline um, of that show. Um, we played second to last, um, so we're looking at Heavy D, uh, Kwame, Big Daddy Kane, who performed before us, and it was like, wow, that's amazing, um, all-female band, and we are our own artists, our own band, and we're second to Shabba Ranks, who was headlining the show, and that was real big, and the Richie Coliseum, I must say, is wonderful, <laughs> that's a big, it's a big Coliseum. Okay, once the girls um, in the first pleasure, they took off on the road um, with Curry Love Bug. Um, I don't know how that went. I didn't hear anything. Um, like I said, all I know is the reason I wasn't taken. Um, well, first of all, I was too young. I was a baby to bay, and I was still in school. Um, and then a lot of controversial, um, you know, lies and stuff that didn't involve me. It had nothing to do with me. Um, and that could have been left out of their mouths. It could have just left and went. What, what, you, what did they say? Um, I wasn't doing good school. I was bad in school, and I was making bad grades, and I was too young, and they talked to my mom, and my mom was like, no, she can't go, and it was all lies. It wasn't true. Um, and like I said, that could have been left out of their mouths, my name, period, out of their mouths, and just go on the road. Um, and then um, I ran into a friend um, who said that Miss Mack was starting a second all-girl female band, and she wanted to have me as a Congo player. Um, who is, is Miss Mack? Miss um, Mack, um, she is actually, um, I believe, Funk and Foot's mom. Mm -hmm. Um, she owns Rare Essence. Um, she was starting a second all-female band. She had a first all-female band, and she was starting a second all-female band, and she wanted me to play congos. 
so what happened, um, we had a show, we opened up, um, it's the first um, act on, at Wilma's Park. Um, it was a uh, Wilma's Park, Park back then, it was big, and, you know, big bands from the DMV on there. Red Essence, EU, um, who was out there then? Uh, class band, you know, big bands like that, they were out back then, and that's like in the early, uh, the late 80s, early 90s. You open for Essence? We open, um, we open for Essence, um, and I believe Roy um, Battle was there. Uh, actually, Hako Sweat was on that show too, um, at the Women's Park, and he was like, "Oh my God!" He was like, "You know, Boogie got better. You know, she must must have been rehearsing and, re and practicing." But um, that had nothing to do with anything. Um, he just looked, talked to me, and he said, "You know, Charlie." Um, you know, the name Pleasure, we had to relax that for a minute, but um, we're regrouping, and you're still the only original member left, and um, you still want to come back and play, um, you know, we need you to play, and I was like, well, I didn't quit, so, <laughs> so, he, um, Charlie ended up getting um, Pleasure back rolling again with new members, and me as the original member, um, back in the group. Um, I was playing better and stronger as ever. Um, the second, um, the second set of girls, I'm saying, um, they were all pretty much my age range, um, which is the first set of uh, girls in pleasure. They were older than I was. I was the baby of the band, um, so we had more communication um, in the second group there because because of the same the same age um, difference um and that's when we um got more all we got more offers we were in sister to sister magazine the washington times the washington post um we were doing uh more shows on the road um sometimes two shows in one day from like roanoke virginia they had to pack up and leave and, and go to like Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, we had a pleasure van also. Um, and that's how we traveled. Charlie, um, he used to drive us to every show. <laughs> we started recording more in the studio also, making uh, more PA tapes, um, pushing um, out to the radio stations and also um, the record stores back then, um, it was record stores <laughs> back then. Um, you have Kent Mill, um, S Sam Goodies. Yeah, Am I saying that right? Sam Goodies. <laughs> um, and a lot of, uh, you had a lot of um, record stores that were open back then. So you, would, you were able to sell your, your um, tapes back then. Um, we also did that Christmas um, song that's on the um, CD. I mean, I'm sorry, it was CD now, but um, it was PA tape back then, um, which is still going strong. <laughs> and that's about 30 years ago. Um, and that was the, first, the second um, round of girls um, for pleasure. Um, the um, downfall with the girls, the second set of girls, um, we had two depths in the band and that's how the band um we had to slow down pleasure again and regroup again with um a third set of girls in the group um so we um pleasure um we got offered to do um, a Christmas go-go CD, um, which it was other artists that was on the CD. Uh, on the CD. What's the name of that song too? D, I mean, um, tape, cassette, why can't you say CD? Um, so, you can say CD now. Right? Santa Claus coming to town? Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. But it's called, the, I think it's called the go-go Christmas or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's all good. We got offered, okay, Pleasure got offered to do a go-go, um, a go-go CD. Um, <laughs> Say CD, it's cool, it's cool. <laughs> well, it's probably on CD now. Yeah, it is. All right. So, we, um, one year, Pleasure got offered to do a go-go. It's called a all-star, all and we were part of that all-star go-go band. 
thing in the DMV. Mm-hmm. We were offered to do a all, it's called an All Star Go Go Christmas PA tape. Um, <clears throat> Charlie wanted to do it different. Uh, we usually record in his studio. He wanted to do it different, so um, he went in. Um, um, he went together um, with uh, Lazar, sorry, Lazar Records, and they decided, well, let's take them to Philly, and let's um, record their um, their song, their Christmas song there. They wanted us to do um, Santa Claus Coming to Town, so that was our part um, on on the deep, um, on the tape, on the cassette tape. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> so um, we get to the studio, and we're like, "Wow!" And then they explain to us that um, this studio, this is um, where Elvis Presley first did his uh, one of his songs. Um, he recorded one of his songs on, um, you know, in the studio here where we were recording that. So we was amazed by that. We was like, "Wow!" That was Presley. Wow, we was amazed. Mm-hmm. Um, the studio was really nice. You know, pictures and autographs everywhere from different artists who, big artists, national artists who was, you know, in there besides Elvis Presley. Um, when we went in, usually we record together as a band. We recorded together as a band, but we were in separate rooms. Um, I had my own booth and room, um, the lead rapper also, the own booth and room, but you can hear each other once you put the earphones on, they gave you earphones. <clears throat> and then the engineer <clears throat> who was recording it would say, you know, push this little uh, monitor up on the PA board and say, all right, we're going to take it at three, and then he'll count down, and then you, he'll plug in the music from the keyboards, and then you come in with your part. And you're not playing with the whole band. You're listening to the band in your earphones, but you're playing on your own. Um, That one song, uh, I would never forget because I was hungry. I was tired. It took 24 hours to do that one one Christmas song. It wasn't like we were doing a whole... (laughs) A whole PA tape. We was doing one song. And it took 24 hours. I fell out. On the floor, I was crying. I said, I'm tired, I want to go home, I'm hungry. But over and all, it was worth it because that was like 30 years ago, and they're still playing that same song every Christmas. So that was tight. It was a good experience. Um, so, um, once pleasure, um, once pleasure, um, finally ended, um, I was working my regular <clears throat> nine to five. Um, I started my own um, little boy band. Um, they were all in high school. Um, they actually went to Bladensboro High School. And um, they all can play instruments. So I learned from Charlie, um, following him around, you know, with the bands, Hako Sweat and everything, the shows and stuff. I learned he taught me how to do PA board, um, hooking up speakers and, you know, doing sound and so I decided I'm gonna go ahead and manage a, a boys band so what I did was um, went to a couple of different pawn shops um, to start you know getting speakers um, see if I can find PA boards um, you know chords mics and as much stuff as I could um, also went to the music store and bought a new set of drums and um, I already had Congos um, um, set up in the house um, so I had about eight of those, eight Congos. So I didn't have to get those. Um, I invested like in some keyboards at the pawn shop and stuff like that. So I really did. I did both music store and pawn shop, and I got the little boys band together. And um, I kind of I had them really rolling for about a year. Um, they were playing at boys the boys and girls clubs uptown. Um, I had a promoter who. Um, was a regular at um, you know my old job uh, where I was working. And he actually um, helped me as far as getting shows and stuff because he ran the Boys and Girls Club um, up on, um, I don't want to say 4th and Kenny, it wasn't Kenny Street. It was, it was uptown. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's get on right now. Okay. But he um, actually was calling me and was like, you know, 
I'm trying to keep these kids out of trouble. And I, you know, I, I own the boys and girls clubs, you know, in the DC area. And it's like, you know, you, your band can do shows. And so we, I was actually getting them shows for about a year. Um, and so that's one thing I was doing um, when I wasn't playing with pleasure anymore. I decided to get my own group together instead of me playing and let me manage something. <laughs> and I, I, I knew, had a little bit of knowledge from Charlie teaching me, um, you know, instruments, how to work on them and how to do, you know, the PA board and sound and all that. So. So um, after, um, you know, that recording of that Christmas um, PA tape, um, it, it was a couple of um, deaths in the group, um, two deaths that occurred. Um, you know, we, the pleasure laid out for a minute. Um, shows kind of backed up, you know. We stopped playing for a minute. It was a lot of controversial things going on as far as um, a lot of stuff happening in the, in the city, um, clubs shutting down, and 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 they wasn't having go go's at this certain time of the night, and you know this certain time of the day. It was a lot of stuff going on in the city. Um, so I laid low for a minute, and I started you know working a regular um, you know nine to five, and I get a call from Juju and. Uh, my Isha, and she was saying she was forming my Isha and the hip huggers back together. And Juju was like, uh, "Girl, you you don't need to be resting. You need you need to be out here exercising and, and working and working. You don't need to you don't need to be sitting down. You're too good. You're too talented." It was like, um, you know, I I train you on you know what you're missing and what you think you're missing, but I need you. I need you to come play. So I was like, okay. So I was very interested because I love my Isha. Um, and Juju, I love Juju to death. So um, I didn't even have a set of Congos anymore. Um, Juju actually um, offered me to buy his Congos, and he gave it to me for a cheap price. And he's like, "You're gonna need them." Um, he was like, "You know, so you can do some practicing and all that." And um, so we practiced for a while at Maisha's house, and um, Juju um, was my trainer. Um, I wasn't used to nobody else training me but Roy Battle. He was, a, you know, my music director and my trainer. Um, I trained with Juju, and um, Juju would play. I was like, come on, girl, get your energy up. Get your energy up. I was out of breath for like 10 minutes. <laughs> I was like, can you slow down? He was like, no. You got to keep playing. Keep on, keep on playing. So um, I also, because my issue is a jazz R&B soulful singer. She um, did. We did shows at the Blues Alley. Um, I had to bring out the chimes, um, the triangles. Um, had timbales, rollers, horns. So I had to play all the um, other percussion instruments um, besides congos. So I incorporated all that together um, with him. And Juju was a big inspiration because he really helped me um, get my exercise together and made me stronger. Because I did lose like you know, my muscles, you know, from playing and, you know, playing with pleasure and not using wrist weights no more. I did, you know, lose some of that stamina, you know, from back then. So, so I got my, you know, I had to get my wind back together um, to play with Juju. Um, so, Maisha, um, we in the hip hop has played for a while and then um, um, I had to chill out a while and started working. I was still working my regular um, nine to five, but um, you know that's when the baby came along. Um, and I was about eight months pregnant, and he, um, sugar bed <laughs> called. Um, he's like, "But hey, <laughs> I need you to play." <laughs> I was like, "Huh?" I said, "You do know that I'm eight months pregnant." So you can still play. Come on, girl. I need you to play at the show with me. So I was like, oh, okay. He was like, I'm going to pay you. You're going to be good. And I was like, it's, it's okay. I'm not worried about that. I'll do it for you. You know, I love you to death. So he was like, come on. Come on, play with me. You know, I, I love the way you play and love the way you perform. So I was like, okay, cool. So um, we did the Zanzibar um, with Essence, Rare Essence. And um, we played two sets. And... You know, I played, my stomach was all the way out here like a basketball. <laughs> I had to scoot up to the Congos to play. But 
you know, their love and he said I did a good job and I appreciated him for, you know, wanting me to play and knowing that I'm was eight months pregnant and actually could have, you know, broke my water on stage or something <laughs> at the time. <laughs> But he was a big inspiration also. Um, he always told me, don't give up. Um, you need to still be playing. Or, you know, you don't need to retire. Or you need to play with someone or get your own band together. He was a big inspiration also. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, so um, end up going to, um, to medical school and getting into the medical field. And, you know, once I graduated, um, you know, got a job in the medical field, started working, um, started working um, in the medical field. And I wasn't even thinking about, you know, playing. I was done. I was like, I'm retired. You know, I got my baby. You know, I got to get her into something, you know, some music. Um, didn't want her to play what I played, any percussions. I wanted her to play piano. Um, keyboard, guitar, bass, something different other than what, you know, I've been through as far as messing my hands up and what her hands look like mine's with the calluses and everything. Um, <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, as I, you know, relaxed during those years, my calluses cleared up with my hands. So I was fine. I was able to get my nails done and everything without them cracking and, and breaking and stuff. So um, I get a call from John. Um, John Akers, and he's the manager for Belladonna, and he was like, um, you know, Boogie, you know, I, I love the way you play, and, you know, I want you to come play with us. And he was like, you know, we need you to play. And I was like, y'all don't need, y'all is doing a wonderful job. I said, um, I hear, you know, you know, when I was working at, where I was working at, I had, people coming out and, you know, saying how they, the girls sound good and, you know, the music sound good and they really, they crank. And I was like, you know, they doing fine. I was like, you know, I'm in retirement. My hands are uh, smoothing out. You know, I ain't got to worry about the hurt and pain no more overnight <laughs> when I come home from a show. And I was like, you know, I'm not really, I'm done. I'm not really ready to play anymore. So... He was like, you know, if whenever you want to come play, let me know. Um, it can be here and there, you know, how, you know, if you don't want to play all the time here and there. Um, and what happened was uh, Chris, he plays for Trouble Funk. He was playing um, Congos then um, for Belladonna. And he also played for Trouble Funk. And he had a show, so they both called and asked, you know, can I step in and play? And I also, I also think uh, Mighty Mo, he was playing too. And I think at the time, he had a show with EU. He was playing with EU at the time. And so I was like, okay. So, you know, I played with them for like a weekend or two. And <clears throat> after that, you know, I went back to my normal life. And I was just relaxing. And then I get another call again. And, um, you know, they wanted me to come and play with Bella. And then I kept hearing, you know, from... A lot of fans that I still had, which I didn't know I had, um, <laughs> that still exist. <laughs> you need to play. You need to play. You need to play. You know, that's all I have. You need to play for Belladonna. They need you. And I'm like, they don't need me. you saying that because you like the way I play. But, you know, they don't need me. They're doing good of what they're doing. They're doing fine. It's like, no, they need you. You know, it needs to be all females. And I was like, well... I mean, they can train, you know, it's other female Congo players out here, you know, they can train. They was like, no, you got what it takes, you got it, you can't retire, we need you, we need you. So that's all I kept hearing from the fans. And and I was like, but I can't, I'm playing softball. And they were like, what the heck is a softball? And I said, you don't understand, my family, my whole family, my mom, my father, my aunts, my uncles. Uh, softball was big in Maryland, D.C., um, and Virginia, too. And they had softball leagues out here. Just like they got bowling leagues and all types of leagues, they had a softball league. And I was playing for a co-ed team. And I was actually getting, my like, trophies and VI, uh, um, MVP, you know, of the team and all that. And I was, you know, that's what my hobby, my hobby was besides working and taking care of my child. My other hobby was softball. So 
they was like, well, you ain't getting paid. You can get paid playing with the band. And so, <clears throat> what it was, I broke it down. <clears throat> so then I was like, look, basically, I don't want to play no more. I'm in retirement. <laughs> I don't want to play. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Came about a year later. Just or something. That's cool. Came about a year later. <laughs> about a year later, <clears throat> I get another call for John, and me and John sat down and had a talk. Um, left him to death because you know he's real, and you know he, you know he looks after you. He reminded me of Charlie um, Fenwick, out my old manager. You know how I used to hang with him and all that. <clears throat> John was the same way. He was real cool, and um, and he looks out for you know he looks out for the girls, and you know looked out for me. And, and then we talked about, you know, pay. So everything was good and, you know, I liked him as a man. If it was somebody else that came to me, you know, as a management, as management or whatever, I, would, I don't know about that. <clears throat> but, you know, the way that he came to me and we sat down and talked and stuff, it, it was real cool. So that's how I <clears throat> decided to go ahead and play with Pleasure um, because of the fans also. No. Bella Donna. You said pleasure. I said pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and since from that conversation, since then, and bands has been rolling. <laughs> having fun, you enjoying it. I'm having fun, enjoying it. Um, I'm older now, so I do get a little tired. Um, not doing the show, but you know, after. Mm -hmm. You know, because I do work, on, you know, my nine to five, so, you know, we have a show and then I have to wake up and go to work the next morning. <clears throat> but I manage both, and then taking care of children and cleaning house and cooking and it's a lot of work. <laughs> but I'm multitasking, they call me superwoman, <laughs> so my family do, so. And just as well as the other women in Belladonna doing the same thing, um, working, cooking, cleaning, children, you know, uh, church. You know, some of the girls, you know, play in um, gospel groups at the church. So we all multitask. So we're all super women in the group. 